Jesus. Let the King of glory come in. That's where we are standing. We don't need to be out there in luxury. No, time for luxury is coming. When Jesus comes back. Hallelujah. Right now it's time for war. Glory to God. So anyway, let's continue with Esther. I might preach in this place today and then we might never get to Esther. So, the meaning of Esther. The meaning of the name Esther. Every name has a meaning. You should know the meaning of every name, especially your own name. Because God does not give names haphazardly. Each name has a meaning. Esther, uh, first of all, remember Esther, uh, and we'll talk about this more in the, in, the, in the few weeks that come. But Esther was a Jewish girl. She was a cousin of Mordecai. But her name was Hadassah. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah. But when they went into exile, just like Daniel, they had to change their names. Amen. They had to take a slave name, so to say. And so the name Esther has two roots. One of them is a Persian root, and it is the name Satara, and it means a star. As a matter of fact, it, 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 it's particularly Venus, the morning star. Praise the Lord. The morning star. If from the Hebrew, the Hebrew also, when you do the Hebrew study, they say they claim this name also came from them. And it is the Hebrew name Hester, which means hidden. Which is interesting because Esther was hidden for a long time. As a matter of fact, she hid her identity until she became a queen and even when she became a queen she continued to hide her identity and her identity was only exposed when she had to use her identity to do what? Save. To save the children of the Jews. So understand this dear friends, in this world we are undercover agents of the kingdom of God. Many times people don't know who we are. Glory to God. People don't know who you are. The enemy doesn't need to know who you are most of the time. It is only when you come and you are, you are dressed in sheep's clothing and you look just like a regular person and then when you remove that sheep's clothing and then they see that underneath is a lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah that dwells within you. And when you begin to save the people of God, when you begin to save the people of God in prayer, when you begin to draw people out of the kingdom of darkness, that is when the enemy knows, oh, I think we got a warrior in our hands. I think we got a star in our hands. I think we got a hidden agent in our hands. Praise the name of the living God. This world belongs to the devil. Praise God. Understand that. And the systems of this world belong to Satan. The financial systems belong to Satan. The governmental systems, the schooling system belong to now you may say, but doesn't the word of God say that the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to me? Doesn't God say that? Yes, he does. He has the title deed of this whole universe. He owns it because he made it. However, when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave up the lease. They gave up the right to have dominion to Satan. So until Jesus Christ comes back, and establishes his kingdom, Satan is still in charge. That's why the Bible says, the God of this world. There is the God of that world, which is Jesus, and then there is the God of this world. And that is why you must understand why you are being told by the word of God, do not conform yourself to the patterns of this world. Because this world belongs to the king of darkness. But when you begin to conform yourself to this world and you begin to justify why you do this, why you do that, why you are so caught up in the things of the world, you are just lying to yourself. Amen. Now, should we work in the secular world? Yes. Should we work in the government? Yes. But we work with the attitude knowing I am not a part of it. Amen. Hallelujah. I am not a part of it. I will not conform to it. I will obey the laws that need to be obeyed. I will go when they want me to go, but I am here as an ambassador. 
I am here as an agent of the kingdom of God. Yes. And so therefore, I never forget who I am. So that now, when God comes and tells me, rise up, go to another city, I don't start to say, oh, but Lord, I have built this investment, I have, I have bought houses, I have bought cars. I'm just an agent. Amen. I just move on. Yes. Amen. I don't get caught up in the things of this world. Amen. I am in the world, but I am not of the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, glory to God. Be in the world, but be not of the world. Yes. Hallelujah. You are of Christ. You do not belong to yourselves. You have been purchased at a price. And the price was high. Amen. Glory to God. Yes. So you are not to do your own thing. Yes. Come on. Yes. Forget about your own dreams. Yes. And your own visions. Yes. And your own plans. And begin to say, I am not going to trust any longer in my own understanding. Yes. But I am going to trust the Lord with all my ways. Yes. Glory to God. When you begin to do that, now you are beginning to walk with the Lord. Yes. Now you are beginning to release the power of heaven. Yes. Hallelujah. Many Christians today are walking powerless. Many Christians today are walking in shame and in defeat because they have not released the world. It is not because the power of God is not available. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, Is my arm too short to save? Is there anything too hard for God? Nope. Is there any situation in your life that God is like, oh, I gotta think about this one. No. Oh, I gotta, I gotta figure this one out. For God is like, I already did it. Yeah. I already paid for it. Right. But because we are still caught up in the relationships of the world, we are still caught up in money, we are still caught up in dreams and visions that have to do with the flesh, then we live in defeat because we are under the king of darkness. But the moment you step out of that and you begin to say, the one who is in me, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. And I am going to begin to walk in light. I am going to begin to walk in the name of Jesus. Like David. Remember, when Goliath comes against David with a javelin and with a big, big, big shield and with a big body, with the system of the world. And David says, you come at me with a javelin and a shield. But I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord. I will take off your head. And he was able to take off his head. Hallelujah. Because of faith in God. Come on, you are made to be greater than you are right now. Hallelujah. When I say that, don't feel bad. You are made and you are, you are designed to be greater than you are right now. You are a king. You are a queen. You are a dominator. You are a conqueror. Hallelujah. Don't live below what you are. Glory to God. When it comes to God, don't think yourself too highly when you are facing God. But when it comes to the world and the systems of the world, they are to be under your feet. Glory to God. They are to be under your feet. The devil is to be under your feet. Infirmity is to be under your feet. Depression is to be under your feet. Hallelujah. There is no chain, there is no yoke that is in your life right now that is greater than you. No. He who is in you is greater. All you need to do is to begin to yield. All you need to do is to begin to die to self and begin to say, you see, Jesus is not just saying die to yourself and then live in poverty or live in, 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 in depression. No, he says, die to yourself so that I can be resurrected in you with the resurrection power. Hallelujah. What you need is the resurrection power in your life. Resurrection power is greater than disease. Resurrection power is greater than poverty. Resurrection power is greater than anything that the enemy can throw at you. You need resurrection power. Yes. I need resurrection power. Our church needs the resurrection power. The city needs resurrection power. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Yes. So even though we are hidden, yes. we are stars of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, say, I am a star. I'm a star. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, I, even though I am hidden. Yes. Hallelujah. Come on, let's say, even though I am hidden, yes. I am a star. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Now, this book of Esther has 10 chapters. Okay, I'm going to go through this part very quickly. 
there's 10 chapters, so we are going to have at least 10 weeks of going through it because we want to take at least a chapter uh, a week. Uh, this is one of three books in the Bible that has a woman as the main character, the star. Hester, the star. Satara, the star. Now, since we are in a church and we know the Bible, which are the other two books apart from Esther? Ruth. Ruth is one of them. And number three. So Esther and Ruth have a woman as their main character. What is the third one? I guarantee you, you will not find it in your index. Deborah. <laughs> you have to know the content of the book. No, Mary is not the character, is not the main character of any of the gospel because Jesus is the main character of the book. The song of Solomon. The song of Solomon. The song of Solomon that was written to the queen. Hallelujah. The song of songs. Now, uh, this book is about the deliverance of the Jews. And so, therefore, it is about the deliverance of God's people. And so, if there is anything that is going on in your life that needs deliverance, you will find the principles, you will find the anointing in this book. Because it is talking about deliverance. Hallelujah. If there is anybody in your family that needs deliverance, we will find it here. So, this is going to be an exciting study. This is going to be a time of the breaking of yokes. This is going to be a time of the opening of prison doors. This is going to be a time when you're going to see your family released from yokes that have come through generations in the mighty name of Jesus. For the spirit of Esther is going to rise up amongst us in the name of Jesus. Because the spirit of Esther is the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, this book is very unique in that it is the only book in the Bible that has no mention of God at all. Amen. There is no mention of God in the book of Esther. There is no worship. There is no praise. There is nothing at all about Yahweh, about God. There is not even a place where they say they went to. The, the only hidden thing is when we are told that Esther fasted and prayed. But we are not even told how she prayed. So it is the only book in the Bible that does not have the mention of God. And so the question then becomes, how did it find itself inside the canon of scripture? And the simple answer is because God wanted it to be like that. And the second reason is this, is that sometimes God works in hidden ways. Sometimes God does not work in a public and an open way. Many times he does. But there are many times that God will work in very hidden ways. However, even when God works in a hidden way, one thing is very clear. That the evidence of what he does is so clear that everybody must stand and say, this has to be God. Amen. So whenever you hear somebody tell you, well, you don't see me in church, you don't see me in ministry, well, God is working secretly, Say, I agree with you. I agree with you. God is working secretly with you. But show me the evidence. Because the Bible says you shall know them by their fruit. You may not see the roots. You may not see even the tree itself. But you will see the fruit in the market. Yeah. Hallelujah. If there is no fruit that is God-sized, if there is no fruit that is speaking about the power of God, then probably God is not in it. Praise the name of the living God. Because God, when he works, he produces an evidence so that, because everything that God does is so that people can come to say, God is great. God is awesome. God is mighty. Hallelujah. So that's why we even look at our life and say, God, I'm not seeing you right now. God, I'm not hearing you right now. But please show me the evidence of your presence. Because even when you're not seeing God, there should be an evidence of his presence. There should be breakthroughs that you, are, that, you, that you are obtaining. There should be victories that you are obtaining. Even if it is not on a daily basis, you should be looking back and saying, how did I get through that? What about, how did I get through that? That had to be God. That had to be God over there. Because when you know that God is with you, it doesn't matter what situation you're facing. You can go through it. Hallelujah. Now, we are going to look at 
chapter 1 in three ways. Amen. Three ways. So that we can make it simple. There are three parties that are represented in this chapter. There are three feasts. There are three times when people come together to have a good time. And we see the first one from verse 1, actually, actually up to verse 4, and it's the 180 day party. The 180 day party up to verse 4. It says verse 8 on, on, on my screen, but that's not really entirely true. Then there is the second party, which we shall call Vashti's party. It's in verse 9. And then there is a third party, which is the seven day party. Amen. Now, why is it that God... Now, understand this, by the way. This is a real story that happened. So, this is not a parable. This is not a, 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 a legend. This is not a myth. This is a real story. But why did God arrange things in this way? What was it that... He? Because everything that happens, God has a hand in it. Amen. And so, even in a story of just people, we just we hear a story that happened, we must look at it and say, if God is in it, there must be something for us to learn. So, why did God arrange it like this? And why did it have that in all of the things that could have been said about King Xerxes and Vashti, that these three parties are what appear, first of all. And I want to give you a couple of ideas. If you look at the first party, from verse 1 to verse 4, it says, actually it starts from uh, verse 3. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and the nobles of the provinces. Verse 4, the celebration lasted 180 days. A tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and the splendor of his majesty. So we see here, number one, a party that lasts 180 days. <coughs> that is a full six months of party. And we are told that the people who are invited, apart from the king himself, were all the military officers. I want you to, to notice the, the participants. The military officers the princes, the nobles, and the leaders. So this was a party of only high people. This was not a party of just anybody. You had to be, you had to be royalty. You had to be military. Hallelujah. And it was for six whole months. And the purpose of the party, we are told at the very end there of verse 4, that the purpose was that the king wanted to display in my Bible, it says a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and the splendor of his majesty. Doesn't it sound a lot like our God? That our God always wants to display, what do we call it? His glory, his splendor, his majesty, his kingdom, so that when his kingdom is seen and we see the glory of his kingdom, we can say, our God is a great God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven with wisdom and love. Our God is an awesome God. Hallelujah. And so, why six months? Now, this text doesn't tell us, but I can give you a couple of of my ideas that I, as I was meditating on it, the Lord told me, these three parties represent the three stages of humanity. Between the beginning of humanity until the day of judgment. And he says that in the first 180 days, they represent the six days of man. The 6,000 years of man. When God has been displaying from the very beginning through the stars, through nature, through miracles, through Israel, through the church, through the cross, through our times, God is constantly displaying his opulence, his wealth, his majesty, his splendor. Hallelujah. And he is constantly inviting people 
not just anybody. Because we read in Matthew chapter 22 that many are called, but few are chosen. Hallelujah. He says, my party for this time is only for the military people. My party at this time is only for the kings and the queens and the princes. Hallelujah. God is calling you to participate. God is inviting you to participate in the execution and in the enjoyment of his kingdom. Praise the name of the living God. You see, we are not just being called to have a church. We are not just being called just to come here and sing songs and pray prayers and scream all night. No, we are being invited to advance the kingdom. We are being invited to rule over our people, to rule over demons and powers and principalities and diseases and all the things that are in this world. The Lord is laying a, a banquet for the soul for any that will accept the invitation. And I want to ask you a question this afternoon. Have you accepted the invitation? Hallelujah. Now I know it's much easier to say, yes, I have. Yes, I have. But the evidence that you have accepted the invitation is that you have become a king. Is that you have become a military ruler. Is that you have a territory that has been granted to you. Because all these people that were called here, they had a territory. They had a span of control. What is your span of control? Where is your space? It could be, now don't think of it lightly, it could be just your home. Maybe you've been given a wife and children and God is saying, this is your kingdom. Are you ruling over it with power? Are you ruling over it with authority? The Bible says in, in, a, in the book of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 that if an, a pastor wants to become an elder, a pastor, there must be a man who has their home in subjection. Hallelujah. They rule their household well. They are not authoritarian. They are not dictators. But they rule well. Their people in their home are happy. Their wives are happy. Their children are happy and provided for. They are well taught the word of God. This man is worthy to sit in the seat of an elder. Because if a man is able to rule his house well, then he's also able to manage the affairs of the house of God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the living God. But you see, he has, maybe he has given you a, an authority on your job. Maybe you are a supervisor. Maybe he has given you a career. Or he has given you a, a, a business. Maybe that is your span of control. How are you ruling it? Are you ruling it according to the dictates of this world? According to the, to the principles of economics? Or are you ruling it? And reigning over it according to the word of God. Are people coming to Christ because of the way that you operate in your place of authority? Are people coming to worship God more because they are now receiving revelations? You see, Nehemiah was not a preacher. He was not a priest. He was not a prophet. He was just a military ruler. But Nehemiah lived such a way that a whole book had to be written about him. Amen. People began to worship God again. See, you can be a supervisor in a place and if you, if you, if you purpose and you are, you are praying to God and saying, God, this place that you have put me in, I want your kingdom to come. You are praying constantly the way Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name in this place. Let your kingdom come in this place. Let your will be done in this place. You pray like that fervently, effectually. Then God begins to lift you up in that place. And in a place where they say that the name of Jesus cannot be mentioned, they will, they will find that in your job, that lunch hour is a time for prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. Amen. There are many people in this country, they work for very wicked bosses, but lunch hour, there is a prayer time. Morning time, they start with prayer. They even hold teams that they start with prayer. Why? Because one person has taken their authority. One person has taken it seriously. And they have said, I have been given something mighty and I will not rule over it using their rules. I will not play on their turf. I will play on God's rules. Praise the Lord. So, the first six months, 
are talking about our life now. That we are invited daily to the party of God. We are invited daily. That's why we, when we come into the, into the presence of God, He begins to display His splendor. He begins to display His pomp. He begins to display His angels. He begins to display the anointing. Hallelujah. He begins to display revelation, the gifts of the Spirit. You see, this King Xerxes, even though he was a wicked king in real life, in this story, he is actually a type of God. He is actually a type of Christ. And he is inviting us to this party. Amen. But I want you to see that there was another party also in verse 9. And in the other party, there was a woman who was a queen. She was the wife of the king. Or let me put it more correctly. She was supposed to be the wife of the king. But look at how she did it in verse 9. He says, at the same time, at the same time, what is happening? At the same time that the king is actually hosting people, inviting people, displaying his splendor, what is King Queen Vashti doing? At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of Xerxes. Now, it may be that in real life, in that time, that women maybe were not allowed to mix with men. But in the spiritual meaning, because now we know the story of Vashti, this woman, instead of seeking, because we know Esther later on that she would have a party with the king. But this woman was having her own thing. She was doing her own thing. Hallelujah. This is a kind of Christian. The church is going this way, but they are doing their own thing. We say, let's go and have prayer. They say, I'm not coming to prayer. Why? I pray. I pray my own way. Well, let's go and do evangelism. Uh, I do evangelism my own way. Let's go and have a fellowship together, just eat together. Uh, I don't need to hang out with you guys. I have my own way. So this is the person who does it their own way. Praise the Lord. I put it on the church level. This is also the person in their own home. They do it their own way. There is never unity. There is never oneness. There is always a conflict with their spouse. It could be even a husband. It could be the children who are always doing their own thing. Yeah. They don't want to do what their parents are asking them. This is what Queen Vashti was. Whereas everybody else was invited, and she also, because she had the title of a queen, she had the same opportunity to be sitting right there with the king. Yeah. But what did she do? She made her own party. Hallelujah. Now, the old adage applies here. You make your bed, you lie in it. You make your bed, you lie in it, as we shall see in this story shortly. So that's the second party. Is that God is asking you, what kind of a party do you have? Are you part of my party, or do you have your own party? Are you doing your own thing, or are you doing my thing? Are you taking care of my business, or are you taking care of your business? What are you up to? Because what you are up to, when the king is busy arranging a feast for... Now remember in Matthew chapter 22, it says that a certain king did what? Wanted to have a feast for his son. Right? And he arranged the feast and he called everybody and he bought all the drinks and he bought all the food and, 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 and all the decorations and then he sent his servants to go and call his friends to go and call those who ought to have been in the party and what did they do they all began to give excuses they all refused to come so the bible says in that passage and you can read it later on matthew 22 it says that the king said those who had been invited have proved that they are not worthy of the invitation that they have been given. Do you know that there are many people in the kingdom of God today? Because God is very fair. He calls everybody. He's calling you even today. He's saying, come on, I want, I want leaders. This chair should not be empty. He wants you to be the leader. He wants you to be the worship leader. He wants you to be, to be the evangelist. He wants you to be, to, to, to be high in his kingdom. Because he lifts the lowly. 
He leaves the meek. He leaves the oppressed. He leaves those who are rejected. He makes them into something. God never takes somebody and makes them into nothing. He always makes them into something. He will always uplift you. Hallelujah. This is the kind of God we serve. Yes. But many are too proud. Many are too ignorant. And some are even foolish. Because they think they have a better way. Than to accept what God is offering. And you know why? Because God usually offers it through other weak people. 